Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this programme today we'll be discussing the historic presidential election win of uh, Donald Trump and what it means for Israel and the Middle East and I have a special guest joining me all the way from North London. He's an investigative journalist and his name's uh, David Collier. David, absolute pleasure to have you uh, back on the Middle East Report and uh, in Hebrew, Kolokavod for the wonderful work that you do in defending Israel and the Jewish people. Firstly, thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to, to, you know, to come back here. Uh, and David, um, of course, we'll be discussing the incredible US uh, presidential election result for Donald Trump and what that means for Israel and um, the Jewish people. And it's, of course, Donald Trump's second term. So Donald Trump Mark II. Uh, and we'll be looking at the impact of potentially his policies on Israel and uh, the Middle East. Um, but can you share with us how you are personally and how the Jewish community is, particularly one year on from the biggest mass terrorist attack in Israel's history uh, that has led to, by Hamas, a global wave of unprecedented rise of Jew hatred around the world? Look, there's two sides to this. Firstly, there's what happened in Israel, um, and then there's what's happening to the Jews around the world. Um, it, it, we're still suffering a trauma, you know, for, from October the 7th, um, waking up as we did, watching those images of, of those, those I mean, savages running through, um, you know, the, the local kibbutzim around the Gaza area, obviously what they did to the Nova Festival. Um, so that side of things, it's, it's not a question of not having recovered, we're not going to. It, it, it's now, you know, it's a milestone, it's there. It's, it's like the Americans have 9-11, this is for us, this is a, it's a major event because we saw what they do when they have that opportunity. This is what they do. This is, they've always said they're going to do it. They always promise they're going to do it, whether it's Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad. You know, the slaughter of Jews, the massacre of Jews is something they, they openly promise. And we've long said this is what they want to do. Now the world can see that this is exactly what they mean. Don't make excuses for them. When they say it, they mean it. That side of things, you know, like I said, it's, it's a trauma for us. As for what's taking place in the world, again, this is a build-up of decades of mismanagement of the Islamist problem in the, in the West. It really is. Um, this should have been nipped in the bud decades ago. They ignored it. They ignored the rise of Islamist anti-Semitism. They still don't treat it. They still don't treat it seriously. Um, they talk, and all, all of the hate, hate groups are groups that are meant to focus on hate in the United Kingdom. They focus on the far right. Well, I'm not saying that the far right don't exist, but they're not there in numbers. They're not a real threat. The threat is the Islamist threat. When it mixes with the hard left, as we see, we see hundreds of thousands of people taking to the streets of London, chanting for an intifada. We know what an intifada is. We know what an intifada means. It means the murder of Jews. And these groups that our own media call peace groups, because they call them peace marches. They say these are marches for peace, whether it's Sky News or the BBC or The Guardian or The Independent, they all talk about it as if they're peace marches. The groups that are organising it, like the PSC, the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, or the PFB, the Palestine Forum in Britain, or the MAB, the Muslim Association of Britain. The Muslim Association of Britain has been called the, the front for the Muslim Brotherhood in the United Kingdom. These are Islamist groups, they're all pro-Hamas. The Muslim Association of Britain, the PFB, uh, the Friends of Al-Aqsa. We have pictures of them all in Gaza, standing next to people like Haniya. So this is, this is taking place on our streets. This rise, this, this blindness that our authorities have to what, what's going on. When, when they stand and they use the word jihad, and the police don't know what jihad means all of a sudden. And it leads to what we saw this weekend, which is um, buildings owned by Jewish charities being vandalised. This is taking place in London in 2024. It's scary and it's down to the authorities. It's not, it's not about the individuals. This is a complete mismanagement of the problem by the authorities. I'd like to mention as well, um, because what happened to my university, the University of Manchester, with the uh, busts of Chaim Wiseman, the first president of yeah. Israel, was stolen 
by a new group called Palestinian Action wow. Group, and they appear to be extreme leftists who don't even recognise Israel's right to exist, otherwise they wouldn't have stolen the bust of Heim Wiseman, who was, not only uh, was he, did he establish the Jewish Agency, which was a forerunner for the Israeli government uh, and the re-establishment of the modern state of Israel in 1948. He also produced um, acetone, which helped the British war effort and helped Britain win the First World War. So not only is he um, an Israeli icon, but he's also a British icon as well. Um, just share with us your thoughts on that um, horrendous burglary and stealing of those well, bus belonging to Heim Wiseman. Well, Palestine Action have been around now for about four or five years. They're actually a hybrid they are a mix between the Palestinian activism and the climate change activism. I thought so. The, um, the, the two people, who co the co-founders, co um, one was working for the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, the other came from XR, from Extinction Rebellion. And it effectively, it brought the, the uh, direct action that we see of the climate change people into the pro-Palestinian movement or the anti-Israel movement. Uh, what they do is disgusting, it's disgraceful, they vandalise buildings, um, they are a step above the other Palestinian, pro-Palestinian groups because they've, you know, they've used violence, they've hurt police officers, they've damaged buildings, they've damaged property. In my mind, they're a terrorist group and they should be prescribed. It's that simple because, again, it's mismanagement. When they, these people first appeared three or four or five years ago, if the police had stepped down on them then, they wouldn't be here now. This is just arrogance and confidence because they know that they can abuse the system. And what are your thoughts, uh, David, on the current uh, uh, Labour government that's now in power? And, and we've seen this shift in policy direction between uh, the Conservative government that was very supportive of Israel to now a very hostile government, particularly our new Foreign Secretary, David Lammy, who's um, the first time that uh, Parliament has opened from the summer recess after the election. He made a speech um, in which he called for an arms embargo on Israel, uh, reinstated British taxpayers' money to UNRWA, the United Nations Relief Works Agency, knowing the connection between UNRWA and Hamas and the fact that UNRWA gave... Uh, Hamas a few years ago, 2.3 billion US dollars in cash. So we know that these two go hand in hand. Well, when, you, when you're talking about UNRWA, and, uh, I mean, I believe that there's, it's almost like an axis of evil. You know, they, we talk about an axis of, of evil with Iran and Hezbollah. I think there's another one. I think it's, it's the UN, the UNHRC, UNRWA, um, Amnesty, HRW, all of these NGOs and these organizations that claim to be speaking out for human rights, I think, I look on them almost like an act of evil. I used to think it was, you could explain to them, you could talk to them, you could show them the truth and you know they'd see the light, but it's not. There's something quite sinister uh, about everything. And as you say, I mean, Hamas and UNRWA in bed together. There is no UNRWA without Hamas. Um, Gaza is effectively Hamas. One of the mistakes that we see lots of people make is they talk about Gaza as if it's 1% Hamas and 99% innocent civilians. It, it, this mistake, drives the bad reporting on Gaza, when in fact almost every family in Gaza is connected one way or another with the Islamic Jihad or Hamas. They voted them in, they support them. Uh, my own research, you know, I mean, when we see reports, and I've done uh, investigations into the media reports, it's, it's quite easy to see. As for Starmer, look, the, the, there's something quite deceptive about the Labour Party position, because although they have a massive majority, and it is a massive majority, they didn't actually get much of a public vote. Um, a lot of the right-wing vote was split between Reform and the Conservatives, and a lot of seats went to Labour. I can give you an example for exa of South End. South End is a Conservative area, it has been forever. Um, it's now got a Labour MP. The reason it's got a Labour MP is because the Conservative and the Reform vote split. Um, so this is something that Labour is facing. It's facing the knowledge that it's probably holding on to a lot of seats that it's going to lose in the next election. It must be aware of this. Um, so the drive for Labour will be to look for left-wing votes because standing in the middle ground is not going, to, not going to do them any good whatsoever. So Starmer must know, especially as we saw in the recent election, the rise of the group, the Muslim vote, you know, where we now have Islamist parties, Islamist candidates, the whole Islamist movement creating a dynamic around election time. 
So he must also be aware that those millions of, of Muslim votes um, are something he has to, to work towards. So I think it's hostile, and I think it would have been very hostile had it not been for the American election that just happened yesterday. Because I do believe that that is going to have taken the claws and the teeth out of Starmer on an international, on international issues. Absolutely. Uh, and what do you make of um, Starmer really calling out uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for uh, effectively introducing legislation that would essentially ban the work of UNRWA from operating inside Israel? Uh, and surely the international community, even um, the newly elected President Trump, when he's inaugurated as America's 47th president, will no doubt stop US funding to UNRWA. Look, the, Firstly, yes, you would imagine so. He's, he's no fan of UNRWA. We know from his first term, he's no fan of UNRWA. Um, UNRWA shouldn't be, um, I mean, no Western government should be funding UNRWA at all. Starmer's statements are naive. They're stupid. They're dangerous. Um, Israel is more than capable of looking after its own backyard. And the the way that the West handles Israel, it's, it's almost as if, well, yes, they kind of want it to exist, but on the other hand, they only want it to exist on the terms where it's always under threat. Because you can't want Hamas to survive and want to fund UNRWA unless you want Israel to continue to have a terrorist problem. You want Hamas, any normal person would want Hamas driven out of Gaza completely for the benefit of the Palestinians as well as Absolutely. the Israelis. Um, so these kind of messages, this, this kind of return to the status quo, the return to the 6th of October, it has to be pushed. We have to push back at that at all costs. We can't allow that to happen. Absolutely. So let's now see this excellent uh, uh, news report produced by the Israeli Foreign Ministry showing the complicity between UNRWA and Hamas. Imagine a UN agency meant for humanitarian aid infiltrated from within. For years, Israel warned that Hamas had embedded itself deep within UNRWA, the UN agency responsible for education and aid in Gaza. On October 7th, this became undeniable. Israel revealed that UNRWA staff were not just complicit, but actively participated in Hamas's brutal attack on Israel. Schools and shelters intended for aid have been misused as hubs for terror. In July, Israel gave the UN a list of Hamas operatives working within UNRWA in Gaza, yet no action was taken. The shocking reality, operatives embedded in schools using UN facilities as shields. In response, Israeli lawmakers from across the political spectrum took action. With overwhelming consensus, they passed a new law barring UNRWA from operating within Israel and prohibiting Israeli agencies from cooperating with the organization. This law isn't about blocking aid, it's about ensuring humanitarian organizations uphold their mandate without risking innocent lives. Israel remains committed to helping Gazans in need, but we insist on doing so with trusted partners, organizations that actively reject terror. Israel stands firm. There's no room for terror in humanitarian aid. Excellent uh, video there produced by the Israeli Foreign Ministry uh, warning that we should not be supporting UNRWA in its terror activities by supporting Hamas and uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Um, last question, um, David, on, on the UK government. Um, what is your response to the government's uh, role of, tack of confronting Jew hatred? In this country because um, the whole of Keir Starmer's mandate effectively to be Prime Minister was to say that he's cleared up the Labour Party of Jeremy Corbyn, the old leadership, and we've now confronted the, the big issue that plagued Corbyn's leadership was one of Jew hatred and his failure to address it or Corbyn actually being the problem itself and he's saying I've distanced myself from the past this is a new leadership we've dealt with due hatred in the Labour Party have you seen that in action and what has Starmer's response been now that he's in power okay no I haven't seen it in action in fact I've seen the opposite it was something that was quite disappointing for me um, I mean I, my, my pub, public activism because I'd, I'd obviously been doing it behind the scenes for a long time my public activism was really started with the Corbyn years 
And there were a lot of people that we would have considered allies because they were in the battle against Corbyn and they used anti-Semitism almost like a weapon to bash Corbyn. This was factional fighting on, in, within the Labour Party. Um, the question is, did they really have an issue with anti-Semitism or were they just trying to wrest the power back for their particular faction, the Blairite faction or the Starmerite faction? And my experience since 2019 is that all of those allies, or most of them, have disappeared. You know, as we were coming in for the election in 2024, I went to a event that wanted to tell me how good the Labour Party would be for British Jews. And I was listening to them, and it, it was delusional. It really was delusional. Um, but these people, they didn't want to focus on anti-Semitism anymore. Effectively, the people who had been willing to focus on anti-Semitism up till 2019, because they were trying to get rid of Corbyn, after 2019 suddenly didn't want to hear anything. They just didn't want any problems because they wanted Starmer to win the election at all costs. That's one side of it. The second side, of course, is that these people can't say the word anti-Semitism without adding the word Islamophobia. They just can't. So they will fight anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, right? Now, firstly, Islamophobia, in my mind, is a made-up word. I'm willing to use anti-Muslim bigotry, which does exist. Islamophobia is a dangerous word. But secondly, what do you do if the biggest problem that the Jews are, are actually facing is coming from the Islamist community? How can you possibly put anti-Semitism and Islamophobia together? You can't. So it, it, it's almost like a tick box exercise. It's deeply problematic. I don't believe the left really care about anti-Semitism at all. And they certainly, given the fact that they don't seem to be willing for Israel to exist without, you know, um, how, how, they, how they can possibly say they're on our side or, you know, looking after the, 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 the Jewish people at all. It, it's insane. It really is. You cannot um, stand alongside the anti-Israel haters and claim you fight anti-Semitism. You can't do both. No, because we know with Islamophobia, it's designed to close down any debate, any investigation into claims of uh, Jew hatred by radical elements within the Islamic society in order to protect them themselves. Um, because we, I don't see mosques being having big security fences. I don't see mo uh, metal detectors uh, that you need to go through in, in order to enter a mosque. I don't see um, massive security guards outside a mosque or an Islamic centre. Yes, occasionally there's the violence outside a mosque, but it's not the same as the threats that the Jewish community face. I went to an event uh, about three weeks ago at the XL in London. Um, a part of my research, it was run by the Islam Channel. Um, and it had a whole bunch of nasties speaking. It was a two-day conference. Um, and I do what I always do. I go and I listen and I record and all of this. But you get to the Excel Centre, you walk in the Excel Centre. Now, this is a massive Muslim conference for, for Muslims. When and all of the Muslim representatives are there, the Muslim Association of Britain are there. They're, they're all there, there's loads of mosques being represented. Um, and I walked in and you have a ticket and you just walk through and that's it, you're in. Um, if you, you couldn't hold a Jewish event at the XL like that. You just couldn't. The security would never allow it. You'd have to hold it somewhere else. So it just shows you the difference between these two communities. No, absolutely. And I have to congratulate you for a great work that you did on uh, Trevor Asserson's report on, on the BBC because uh, you, you were very much mentioned in that report and, and recently had the, the pleasure of interviewing uh, Trevor Asserson himself. Uh, and he also congratulated you for your element of uh, support and work and research that went into his report. Um, to share with us the importance of Trevor Asserson's report uh, looking into uh, BBC bias, particularly over its coverage of Israel's war against Hamas. Hamas uh, in Gaza from October the 7th? Okay, firstly, um, I mean, I am mentioned in the report and some of my research was used for the report, but this was Trevor's report. It was Trevor and his team that put this report together. So I don't want to be seen to be trying to take credit for it. It wasn't mine. Um, it was an incredibly powerful report. He did in he, brilliant work, uh, you know. Um, the, the issue that we have, and it, it, it's an issue um, I'll focus on Assassin and the BBC, even though we could basically talk about CNN or almost anybody else. 
Um, the BBC's method of reporting on Gaza is fundamentally flawed. Um, my research it was basically to take an article that the BBC had written, any article that the BBC had written on the subject, um, to say, OK, where are they getting the information from? Who are they believing? Who are the witnesses? And who wrote it? The, the, you know, the, the fundamental questions you should ask about any article that comes out. And every single time I was finding that they were relying on witnesses that basically were pro-Hamas. I, you know, I, I found they'd mention a name, I'd go looking for the person, I'd find the person, I'd go through their timeline on social media and I'd find they were supp openly supporting terrorism, openly supporting the slaughter of Jews. Which means that the BBC are not even doing the basic due diligence, you know, of, of checking who it is that they're putting, giving a platform to. I mean, you could imagine the BBC in interviewing someone from Manchester, blindly, they wouldn't do it. They would at least check to make sure that the person they were giving a platform to was decent, you know, had a <laughs> decent ideology. Here they don't. Um, when we started catching them out, my belief is they started playing around with the names. I think they started worrying. I think they started making it more difficult for us to find the people. Um, but the, the main issue that they have is when, when you turn around and you say, OK, how are you going to report on this? The BBC guy in London doesn't speak Arabic. He doesn't really understand Arabic culture. Certainly doesn't know Gaza very well. He has this supremacist attitude where he believes he's morally and ethically superior to everyone around him. Um, so he writes from that perspective. To get to the information in Gaza, he needs someone who understands Gaza. So he turns to BBC Arabic. It's the only way that BBC can report on Gaza is to use BBC Arabic, which means they're now relying on journalists, you know, Arabic journalists or from, from Egypt or from Lebanon or people who have friends in Gaza. So effectively, they're turning to people that are holding hands with Hamas. And, and this creates a problem. It, it, the BBC have a major agency problem. They cannot report on Gaza without holding hands with people that are pro-Hamas. That's fascinating. You just elaborated a lot more from, uh, from Trevor's excellent report. And, and the fact is that whether the BBC are aware of it, but it very much seems they're employing members of Hamas to be journalists for BBC Arabic. Well, I, it's, it's about who's holding hands with who. I don't believe that the actual BBC Arabic person is a member of Hamas, but I don't think they're anti-Hamas. So when they go, for example, they need to find someone to talk to. Um, how are they going to do it? Well, it's runners and fixers, you know, and these runners and fixers are going to be, yes, they're going to be agents of Hamas, and they're going to give you someone to talk to that basically is Hamas, and the Hamas PR are going to clean him up before they put him on television. So all that happens is it turns not just the BBC, but every single Western media organisation into a propaganda arm of a prescribed terrorist group. Uh, which is detrimental not only for Israel's national security, but also for nations around the world, particularly Western nations, to support Israel. And this is, of course, the, the, uh, the weakest part of our democracy is public opinion, and that's exactly what they want to do through the media. Um, talking about uh, the, the other side of the Atlant Atlantic now, which has been uh, an historic week for Donald Trump, um, not only has he won the US presidential elections, and uh, anyone watching our mainstream media thought that this was uh, Kamala Harris was going to be our, the next president, the 47th president. Um, so not only has he won the US presidential election, he's uh, also won the popular vote. Uh, he's now maintaining, he's now won the Senate and also Congress, and now talking about how he will have the opportunity then to put uh, judges into the Supreme Court as well. And uh, effectively, we have the most powerful president um, in, in decades. Uh, share with us uh, your thoughts on this stunning presidential election victory of Donald Trump and the Republicans. Firstly, you just asked me a question about the BBC, and now you're talking about the fact that we're all shocked <laughs> by the fact that Donald Trump has just walked basically a landslide, um, because our media has been telling us the opposite for several months. 
Um, it's quite interesting. I'm not a betting man. I'm not a betting man at all. But I've been following the gambling odds because I, I tend to believe that they tell you something that the media aren't necessarily telling you. So Trump has been the favourite and growing as a favourite for several months now. So they weren't surprised. The bookmakers were not surprised that Trump won. And again, I'm not a betting man. It's just a way of, for me to get information. Um, the media, however, have been desperately going out of their way to manipulate the information that's coming through, whether it's by trying to maintain motivation on the left, you know, as, oh, we can still win this, we're going to win this, you know, because people don't like backing a loser. So maybe they were worried, so maybe they're trying to bolster support. But whatever the reason, what the media are doing is they're destroying themselves. Because the people, are, you can see from the rise of alternative media sources, people have had enough. Nobody, I don't believe a single word. Not, and I, remember, I, I do this for a job. I research what the media says. I know the way they work. I know how bad it is. I would not believe a single word that the mainstream media would tell me about anything. And that's not a good thing because it, it drives people into alternative media sources and you don't necessarily know once you get into that realm, there's, there's also a lot of junk out there. So it, it, it's a bad thing, but the media are doing this to themselves. That's first of all. Secondly, um, look, I believe that, that um, the world is a better place with a strong America. I'm not an American, I'm not an American citizen, and I wouldn't dream of telling Americans how to vote. Um, nor would I really comment on American politics, because that's not my field. You know, I, I listen to people talk about Israeli politics, and I hear it's so, when you talk about something you don't really know, you make a lot of mistakes, so I tend to avoid it myself. Um, but look, we've seen Trump, we had him for four years, we know what he is. He's probably also seasoned, more experienced. He ran a far more professional campaign than he did in either 2016 or 2020. Um, and again, it's a very, very good thing, I believe, that we have a strong America. And we had, basically, we, the Americans had a choice. The Americans either had Trump or Kamala or Harris. And I'm very pleased that the Americans went for Trump. But isn't one of the biggest failings of the uh, previous administration, the Biden administration, is the fact that they didn't know how to use American power? In other words, they did not back up American diplomacy with military power. And this is something that Trump will do, even though he's talked about how he doesn't want uh, wars. He, he wants conflicts to end. He's kind of proud of his previous record of there being no major wars during his uh, term in office. And he obviously would like to keep it that way because he's wanting to make America rich and uh, uh, and also prosperous. And of course, wars cost a lot of money uh, and they drain the uh, nation's resources. Um, but the fact is that Biden never, ever backed up American diplomacy with its military might, uh, and America was seen as weak under his leadership. How do you think that um, Trump will transform America's position on the world stage? Because I think, firstly, I think people are scared of him, and I think that's really important. Because, like as I said, I think uh, the world needs a strong America. I think you're right. I think I think that um, the Biden administration was perceived as weak. I think generally the the left, and not just the Biden administration, have a huge identity crisis. I, I don't think they, they know what they are anymore. I think the fact that um, more working class people are voting you know, for Trump or for the Conservatives or for reform is a sign that the, the, the left have become this elitist, you know, they're almost postgraduates -grad, post in dealing with student politics, talking to other elitists, and that, that they have the, the same supremacist attitude that runs through the core of organisa media organisations like the BBC or the Guardian. You know, it, it, it's all part of the same mindset. Um, and yes, they're inherently weak and unable to back up. It's, for them, it's all words. Everything can be solved through diplomacy. When it actually comes down to the nitty gritty of the actual fist that you need sometimes to back yourself up, they, they don't have it.
Absolutely. And um, share with us uh, your thoughts of, of what uh, uh, a Trump presidency Mark II will mean for Israel. And we know that the Israeli prime minister is one of the first world leaders to actually congratulate uh, Donald Trump on his historic election win uh, on, uh, on Tuesday. Um, look, we, we don't yet know um, the full mindset of the new Trump administration. We have to see how it unfolds geopolitically, looking across the global stage, you know, whether it will remain more isolationist or whether he will, you know, um, do more on the international stage. But that really isn't the point. The point here is about American strength. America has to be seen to be strong. And I don't think there is anyone in the world that will view a Trump presidency as weak. And that's enough really is, because that changes everything. It changes the way that Iran is going to be looking at the situation and the Houthis are going to be looking at the situation and Hezbollah are going to be looking at the situation. Um, it's going to be changing the way that Mahmoud Abbas is going to be sitting in his little office wor worrying now about the next four years. Um, so the, the mere fact that he's won without him actually doing anything changes anything. And we know, look, we saw the last time what he managed to do with the Abraham Accords. Um, and we know Saudi are waiting in the wings. So there's a lot that can happen positively. But I, th I think f not just for Israel, but for the entire world, um, being an, you know, a little bit crazy, having a president that you're not quite sure about is no bad thing. Absolutely. So let's have a look at this uh, excellent uh, CBN news report. And uh, this is the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu congratulating uh, Donald Trump on his historic election victory this week. Netanyahu called the U.S. election a huge victory for President Trump and a, quote, powerful recommitment to the great alliance between Israel and America. Trump's win reunites two leaders who worked together on the Abraham Accords and opposing Iran's expansion throughout the Middle East in Trump's first term. Appearing on CBN's election night coverage, author and Middle East analyst Joel Rosenberg said Israelis favored Trump by nearly 50 points in a recent poll. A 50-point gap in favor of Donald Trump tells you um, that Israelis believe that Donald Trump will be better for Israel, that he that we will be safer, that he will have our back. On the U.S. election day, Netanyahu took a major step by firing his defense minister, Yoav Gallant. In a speech to the nation, Netanyahu said the trust between him and Gallant had broken down over the past few months. Significant gaps were discovered between me and Gallant in the management of the military campaign, and these gaps were accompanied by statements and actions that contradict the decisions of the government and the decisions of the cabinet. After his dismissal, Gallant said he disagreed with Netanyahu on three main issues. A military draft for ultra-Orthodox men, how to resolve the hostage issue, and a commission to determine what went wrong on October 7th. He ended with a salute. To the wounded and the disabled, to the hostages and their families, and to the IDF fighters, I trust you and I salute you. Netanyahu replaced Gallant with Foreign Minister Israel Katz. Israel Katz has already proven his abilities and his contribution to national security, also as foreign minister, as finance minister, as intelligence minister for five years. Former opposition member Gideon Saar will become the new foreign minister. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. There you go, some uh, internal politics there with uh, a new uh, Israeli uh, defense minister as well. Um, going back to Trump Mark One now, uh, historically, it was uh, um, probably the most friendly U.S. administration to Israel in uh, Israel's modern history. Um, the fact that we saw that the uh, U.S. embassy moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem with American recognition of Israeli sovereignty over Jerusalem obviously had a profound impact. And of course, the recognition of Israel's right to the Golan Heights, that strategic area in the north of Israel that borders both Lebanon and Syria. There was also recognition for the first time of the uh, Jewish settlers in yeah, Judea and Samaria, the, which is the biblical heartland of Israel. 
Uh, we also saw that, uh, that ch the Trump administration stopped the funding of uh, UNRWA and those of the Palestinian Authority, pulled out of the disastrous Iran nuclear deal. Um, can we expect the same uh, under President Trump Mark II, knowing that one of the main architects of that was uh, his vice president, uh, Mike Pence, who's no longer there, and there isn't the same evangelical Christian influence within Trump's uh, up and coming administration. Okay, so there's two parts to it. The first part, we don't know yet, um, as I referred to earlier, that how Trump is going to view, I mean, he's gonna set out a list of goals for himself, obviously, and for his administration. Um, we don't know what that list is gonna be or how much it will you know, focus on Israel. As you rightly point out, there were drivers in his administration last time that were pushing some of these uh, positive moves. Um, that's, that's one part. But the second part is, is, is different. Everything you just mentioned is the right thing to do. Everything that you mentioned um, fights back against what has effectively been decades of horrific mismanagement of the Israel, the issue of Israel and its neighbors, decades. In fact, going back from the very beginning, um, when we turn around and we, we look at the partition or where we, we look at how Britain chopped the original mandate in heart, I mean, it's always been bad. The creation of UNRWA, the very creation of UNRWA, um, and, and the idea that the Palestinians should have their own definition of refugees. All of, all of these issues are mismanagement by the West. They never needed to happen. This conflict should have ended in 1949. It really should have done. Is, Israel existed, and every centimeter of what they, they call the West Bank in Gaza was in Arab hands. So if what they wanted was a Palestinian state, then why not create it? Um, they didn't, because that was never the goal. The goal has always been about destroying Israel, and um, mobilizing for that aim. So when Trump, for example, moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, he was moving it to Israel's capital city. Why wouldn't it be in Israel's capital city? Okay. So these kind of issues, or the Golan Heights, Israel's not giving back the Golan Heights. Could you imagine, had Israel given back the Golan Heights, what would have happened during the Syrian civil war? You know, I mean, the attacks that we saw on October the 7th would have been tiny, you know, in comparison to what could have happened from the Golan Heights. Israel's not giving those back. So recognition of Israel's sovereignty of the Golan Heights, the right thing to do. Stopping the, the funding of UNMA, um, again, the right thing to do. Uh, just just one, one small thing, and going back now all the way to the Oslo, you know, the Oslo Accords, which really was the... Um, the beginning of, of 30 years of absolutely nightmarish situation that led to October the 7th, that's being driven by people, not just on the left, but in the center of the political map, that are pushing a perpetuated, an unnecessarily perpetuated conflict. There are ways to get rid of this conflict. If you just basically look at it as a realist, you only speak the truth, and, and you say, you know what, I want to solve the conflict. What's the best way of actually solving it? Then um, you'll find an answer. And that, I believe, uh, is what Trump did. And I don't see any reason why he would act differently this time. And David, how do you think the Iranian regime will respond to the news now that uh, Donald Trump uh, will be inaugurated as America's 47th president? knowing that uh, he certainly cut off the funding of the Iranian regime and under his leadership, Hamas and Hezbollah were complaining that they were running out of money uh, because they weren't being armed by, uh, by the Iranian regime. And knowing that Israel has changed the geostrategic dynamics in the Middle East by uh, virtually destroying Hamas and Hezbollah and has the Iranian regime in its sights, could we see an Israeli-American airstrike to take out Iran's nuclear facilities in the early part of 2025, knowing that we could have uh, uh, the world's most powerful uh, nation, the United States, backing Israel against the Iranian regime? Look, the picture you draw is a possibility. Again, we, we don't know what Trump's plans will be. Um, you're right, the, the situation that Israel finds itself in now 
is very, very different to what it was on October the 6th. Um, th they have destroyed Hamas. There's nothing left of Hamas. You know, I mean, yes, you'll always find somebody willing to stand up and hold a flag or fire a rocket, but um, this is not the same Hamas that existed on the morning of October the 7th. They've been devastated. They've lost an untold number of, of, of you know, terrorists. The, the um, tunnel network has been destroyed. They've got no rockets left, or very few of them. Um, so Hamas is done. So for the first time, um, I think in Israel's history, there's no actual threat from Gaza. You know, it's gone. That real threat has gone. Um, and now Israel is undoing the mistakes that were made in 2006 with Hezbollah in the north. Um, and there's, again, international negligence. The, the war was fought in 2006. The agreements were signed. You know, the UN passed 1701. Hezbollah were meant to be pushed north of the Latini. The, the Hezbollah, the Lebanese army were meant to take control of the south. This was all meant to happen. And in a proper world, with decent governance, they, they, the UN would have stood up, uh, or NATO allies would have stood up and said, this is going to happen now. And again, it's not just about Israel. It's for the benefit of the Lebanese people. Absolutely. The poor Lebanese people. What Hezbollah is dragging that country through again. Um, and the people to blame are the governments, the weak governments of the West that have allowed this to happen. So now we're talking about Iran. And the question is, will weak governance again make the same mistakes as have been made before? And no, I don't think they will. I think if the opportunity is there, and if Iran wants the fight, I think it'll get it. But that's interesting, isn't it? Because um, now that uh, the election results are known, um, we have this interim period um, between when the Biden and uh, Harris administration are still in office in that transfer period until we go into the inauguration in January of 2025, uh, in which uh, Donald Trump will be given the intelligence briefings and everything else. Now, how will the Iranian regime work? They did say that they were going to retaliate against uh, Israel's latest strikes um, in Iran. Um, how will they respond now knowing that Trump's in power, knowing they were dealing with a completely different geostrategic dynamics of Trump being in power rather than uh, what was expected of uh, Kamala Harris I being am, US president? I am willing to do many things and I'm willing to try to analyse and guess many things. What I think is beyond me is putting myself in the mind of the mullahs of Iran. I, you know, I have never understood, ever, why they, and not just the Iranian leadership, but, but why people like Hamas or Islamic Jihad or Hezbollah are willing to drag their own people through the dirt for decades over something that, that you know, I mean, Hamas Gaza could have been a, almost a paradise. It really could have done. But this choice that these people make to destroy their own, you know, environment, their own civilization, over what? Seriously, you look at what Hamas have done to the Gazans over the last year, the devastation. I don't understand it at all. It's not the way my mind works. It's not the way my heart works, you know? Well, couldn't you argue the same lines for Nazism? That the same evil ideology that was Nazism also brought oppression upon the German people because at the heart of this ideology was Jew hatred. And the same with Hamas, the same with the Iranian regime the and, and Hezbollah. It, it's a different ideology, but there is still that infusion of Islamism together with Nazism and this wanting to destroy the Jewish people and the state of Israel as their number one aim and objective, and they're willing to even destroy their own nation in order to achieve it. Abs Firstly, absolutely, you can argue it. I, th I think a key issue here is the difference is religion. You know, we are dealing with a religious and, and a really twisted religious ideology, which I think separates it from Nazism. I do, I do think there's a fundamental difference there. Um, but again, I, I, I think, coming back to the original question, if, if with Trump, um, there is a possibility that they'll take the opportunity because they, you can't keep going on about how you're not going to allow Iran 
to get nuclear capability and then allow them to get nuclear capability. And they will get it. So either you stop it or you accept the fact that they're going to get it. And could you imagine them having it now? Because that, that's, that's what you have to face. What would Iran do now if it already had a nuclear weapon? Be unstoppable. It'd like, be, be like China. Well, that you wouldn't be able to attack the Iranian regime and its leadership without the fear of uh, nuclear retaliation. Well, and, and again, I Iran is quite a big country. You know, one of the situations, one of the complicated situations at the moment is if Israel go, for example, after its, um, you know, fuel uh, facilities or anything like this. There are numerous ones throughout Iran. Israel has three. You know, Israel is a tiny country. If you're dealing with nuclear strikes, you know. There's the, you don't need many. Uh, and, and Shane, I mean, if we look back to Trump Mark I, um, <laughs> uh, as my description of the first Trump administration, he completely changed US foreign policy to the Middle East uh, and decided that the two strong players to back in the Middle East would be Israel and Saudi Arabia. And of course, we've seen that the Biden administration and prior to that, the Obama administration, um, focused on the Iranian regime as the focal point of US foreign policy. They wanted to bolster the Iranian regime at the expense of Israel and, uh, of course, the Saudis. And the success of the Abraham Accords was the fact that the Saudis then instigated the signing of the Abraham Accords with the Gulf states, naming the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. Uh, and now we have an opportunity now with the Trump administration coming in with the Saudis thinking, could the Americans do the same? And so therefore, if this is the scenario that's presented, then surely we're heading for a, a peace agreement, a normalization agreement between the Saudis and the Israelis, particularly knowing that Israel now is the strong horse in the Middle East. Look, firstly, I, I don't understand what Obama um, was doing. I don't understand what Clinton was doing, going back. You know, I, I, if we talk about the Oslo process again coming, because that's the starting point for, yes. for the disaster of the thing. I can't completely hate it. You know, I was uh, September the 13th, I was in Elat, September the 13th, 1993, watching the handshake, I was in Elat. Um, I managed a youth hostel there at the time, and we were watching it on this little screen, um, we were watching it, and, and I was fuming inside, because you could see the mistakes, you know. The, y why bring this terrorist in? What, what kind of you know, idiocy, naivety, to bring this terrorist in to legitimise um, Fatah and Arafat. And I was part of a crowd of about 20 or 30 people watching it, and everyone was clapping and cheering, and, and there was just one other person in that room who was sitting down there, and a big, big frown on her face that, she's now my wife. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's the day we met. Um, so I can't completely hate Oslo, but it, it did bring this 30 years of, of um, bad diplomacy mid and, and effectively was driven by the same uh, political mindset that you're talking about of how they deal with the Middle East. This, this Shia Sunni, you know, which one to strengthen, whether to fight them, play them off against each other and all of this, which has been the dynamic of the Middle East for decades. Um, and it's done no good to anybody. Um, and yes, uh, we're in a situation now where the, the right noises have been coming from the UAE and Bahrain, well, actually from Saudi, because the UAE and Bahrain would never have agreed without Saudi, uh, you know, saying, you go first. Um, and th there's a, a lot that can be done um, still. So yes, we could be seeing a Saudi agreement. Um, and what Israel has shown over the last year is at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is Israeli security. I don't think, and I think a fundamental mistake that Hamas made, and Hezbollah made, and Iran made, is that they thought Israel would buckle. They thought Israel would, would come to the negotiating table and pay that price of allowing Hamas to survive for the hostages. And, and Israel didn't. Israel said, no, not this time. This time you've done it. This time we're going to finish this job. And you know, Kolokovod, like you've got to say to, to, to the Israeli government, fantastically done. They've played their hands so well. Um, because I don't think Hamas realised that Israel will keep fighting. And I think Hezbollah, when they started, I don't think Hezbollah realised it either. And well, I think that's the bigger miracle. 
um, than, uh, than Israel's uh, war against Hamas in Gaza. I mean, for example, I mean, it was something out of a, a sci-fi movie, <laughs> something out of uh, kind of a James Bond uh, a novel uh, in Fleming's book, uh, you know, planting those small devices in uh, those uh, walkie-talkies and pages and getting Hamas off their mobile phones and onto pages and knowing that the Mossad had uh, allegedly uh, set up a factory producing these where they planted these in and it just exposed the entire uh, Hezbollah leadership network uh, and then taking out uh, Hassan Nasrallah, the uh, terror chief of, of Hezbollah and then being able to now um, find all the terror tunnels in the south of Lebanon and almost push so far up to the Tatani River with effectively not that much opposition. Um, and knowing also that the Iranian regime now knows that they could be targeted by Israel at any time. So there must be huge fears knowing that Donald Trump mm. could then occupy the White House come January and the Iranians have to deal with a completely different scenario than dealing with uh, the Biden administration. Which, which leads you on to another important question. What would the relationship, do you think, be like between Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, Donald Trump? They were very close, they were close friends. But we saw that uh, Donald Trump blamed Netanyahu for not endorsing him in the 2020 election, saying, look at all the things I've done for you and you didn't endorse me. Of course, from Netanyahu's position, he can't endorse Trump and take sides in a US presidential election because the ramifications for Israel's security and relationship with the United States if Biden won the presidency, and that was exactly the case. So will we see a restoration of that, that, that friendship on the world stage? Because we know that Netanyahu was the first to, one of the first leaders to congratulate uh, Donald Trump on his election victory. Okay, firstly, when we're dealing with the Israeli deterrence and the, the you know, Israel recreating its deterrence, you just talked about, you're absolutely right. This, this is what they have recreated, an absolute deterrent. Everybody knows now what Israel will do, what, it, what it's capable of doing. And the difference between what happened in October the 7th in Gaza, where Israel's been left blind, Israel was blind to, to October the 7th, an absolute catastrophe that needs to be checked. But they obviously didn't have the internal um, you know, information coming through because they've been out of Gaza for so long. There's you know, no operatives there and so on. The fact that Hamas could get together thousands of terrorists together for an attack on October the 7th without Israel knowing shows how bad things was. When you compare that to what happened in the north and with Hezbollah, um, the in-depth intelligence that Israel must have, must have, must terrify the Iranians because it's probably, half of it's probably coming from Tehran. Half of it's probably coming from dissidents in Iran, you know, people in Iran, and there are a lot of them that hate the Iranian regime. Um, I mean, if, if you go back a few years, Israel walked into Tehran, walked into Iran, picked up filing cabinets, filing cabinets with all of the nuclear secrets, and walked out with them. You don't do that without a lot of help on the inside. As for Trump and Netanyahu, look, Trump's a businessman. He's seasoned. He knows. The, the restrictions that Netanyahu has on him. Netanyahu can't be standing there endorsing anybody um, you know, at, at an election time. That's not his role. His role is to be the Prime Minister of the State of Israel and to preserve the special relationship between Israel and the US. So I, I don't think Trump will hold that against Netanyahu at all. I would imagine that they have spoken hundreds of times over the last four years, and I, I would imagine the friendship will, will still be quite strong. Yeah, let's hope so and pray for that as well. But, but also, do you think with the prospect of Trump back in the White House again, we can start to see a resurgence of our Judeo-Christian heritage as well, um, both in the West and also in Israel as well? Because um, that's the key, isn't it, of Western civilization? It, it's going back to our biblical roots, going back to our foundation, which is our Judeo-Christian heritage that's made the West so strong. Well, the lack of it has made the West so weak. Exactly. That, that absolutely for sure. You, you know, if you, if you take, as, as has happened, um, God out of the equation, which many people on the left have done, you're left searching for a replacement. And, you know, they've replaced it with these ridiculous woke, you know, identity rubbish that they all believe. And it's a religion. It is a religion. You know it's a religion because if you criticise it, you're no platform. If you criticise it, they get hurt. If you you know they're treating it. it. It's their new religion. So, the lack of that has certainly dented um, the strength of the West. And I, I think 
Not so much in Europe. I, don't, I, I honestly don't know what's happening in Europe. I don't know. I, I'm quite pessimistic when it comes to Europe. I think the situation is so bad and so far gone. Um, I'm not saying there's no way home, but we're a long way from it. But the signs in the US, and certainly in Israel, are very different. I, Israel, um, is the, the Israeli um, community is becoming increasingly more religious. Uh, and it, it's been a trend now for uh, decades. And, and not just because the Orthodox people have more babies, <laughs> um, but also generally the, the, there's a more conservative strand to Israeli politics. It drives the left absolutely nuts because they know they're lost. They've, they've lost the argument completely. There is no um, traditional left wing as, as we knew it in the Oslo years. It's gone. It doesn't exist in Israel at all anymore. Um, they hold on to tiny um, parts of the establishment, tiny parts of power. One of them, for example, in Israel is courts, which is why we saw the battle last year over the courts. This is what it is. It's this final battle. So in, in answer to your question, I, look, um, I, I think that the, the, there is a growing religious strand in Israel. And again, I'm not really qualified to mention what's happening in the States. However, in Europe, I think the signs are, are not very good at all. Uh, and also, I think with, uh, if, for example, we, we see two minutes left of the programme, uh, by the way, David, if we see, for example, what we saw during the first uh, Trump administration, uh, and that is a de-escalation of conflict in the Middle East, and probably the, the Middle East under President Trump's influence was probably the calmest that you're probably going to get in, in decades. Um, what do you think this will mean in terms of the epidemic that, that is due hatred because if the Iranian regime is removed um, and there aren't that Islamist terrorism threats stemming from the Middle East attacking Israel then surely this whole worldwide Islamist movement will start to come to a halt and with it this epidemic that is, is due hatred. Sorry big question but 30 seconds. 30 seconds I think you're optimi an optimist and I don't buy into that at all. I, th I think that they've got a foothold in the West I think that they use the Jew hatred as a, as, as a stepping stone, and I think that everybody in the West will be extremely worried about what's coming next. And I don't disagree with you. Um, David, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on pleasure. the Middle East. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure being here. Pleasure. And I want to thank you for watching uh, this uh, programme at home. It feels today as if there's a ray of light uh, shining through the darkness as we've seen that uh, President Trump has uh, won the presidency against uh, Kamala Harris and will be America's next president, inaugurated in January. We also know that this is uh, good news uh, for Israel. It's a good news for those who support freedom and democracy around the world, but also puts the fear of God in the hearts of Israel's enemies. So thank you for watching this week's edition of the Middle East Report.